Siskel and Ebert review Steven Spielberg's saga of a hero who defied the Nazis in Schindler's List. Whoopi Goldberg can't break the habit in Sister Act 2. And Wayne and Garth party on in Wayne's World 2. Oscar Schindler starts out to be a war profiteer and ends up as an unlikely hero in Steven Spielberg's epic film about the Holocaust named Schindler's List. We'll review that film along with the sequels to Sister Act and Wayne's World and the story of Geronimo on this edition of Siskel and Ebert. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Schindler's List, and my first thought after seeing this film was that when I next saw its director, Steven Spielberg, I wanted to say something to him first as a human being and as a Jew, and that was bless you. He has kept alive an event that so many people would like to forget, the Nazi extermination of what was then one out of every three Jews in the world. According to a New York Times story just last week, more than a third of adult Americans don't believe the Holocaust even occurred. Well, Spielberg's extraordinary film, based on true events and real people, turns out to be an indelible record of the pure evil of the Nazi era and the way one man beat it. At first, Oscar Schindler, played by a beefy Liam Neeson, is just a Nazi war profiteer looking to make a buck from the calamity of Poland's Jews being rounded up and having their property taken away. He offers Jewish businessman Ben Kingsley a deal where he'll let the Jews work in a factory as long as Schindler gets all of the profits. Let me understand. They put up all the money, I do all the work. What if you don't mind my asking what you do? I'd make sure it's known the company's in business. I see that it had a certain panache. That's what I'm good at. Not the work, not the work. The presentation. A short time later in Krakow, Poland, the Nazis begin rounding up the Jews to herd them into a ghetto. Spielberg made the brilliant decision to make this film in black and white and shoot it in a documentary-style fashion. <laughs> Later still, as the Jews have been taken to a forced labor camp and Ben Kingsley's character knows that his own life can be ended in an instant, he pleads with Schindler to keep his factory open with bribes and payoffs to the Nazis, believing that while the Jews are working there, they're not as likely to be killed. Herr Director, don't let things fall apart. I work too hard. Another important character in the film is the brutal labor camp commandant, played by a wonderful English actor named Rafe. His character shoots Jews casually from the balcony of his villa overlooking the camp. And here he selects a pretty Jewish woman, played by Ambeth Devitz, to be his housekeeper. Uh, what's her name? Helen Hughes. What? <coughs> Helen Hughes. What? I can't hear. Helen Hughes. And their story is another powerful element in this film, making this all more compelling is that these are real characters. This actually happened. There is a real Helen Hirsch. Schindler's List is not an easy film to review. It simply has one extraordinary scene after another, one smart choice by Steven Spielberg after another. I knew that Spielberg could handle the heroic story of Schindler saving over 1,100 Jews, but what shocked and impressed me was how strong the scenes of Nazi evil were in this film. We see a lot of hands-on killing, a lot of people up close putting a gun to somebody's head, and I thought, good, show it all. It endures in black and white. And then, after all of this evil, Spielberg has come up with one of the most deeply moving endings in motion picture history, an affirmation of the tenacity of the Jewish people that I think any underdog or victim anywhere will be able to relate to. Of course, it's a sad film, terribly sad, but its ending may let your tears flow with a profound and strange sense of joy. It's absolutely true, Gene. This movie was such an awesome experience to watch. And of course, like everyone I had heard, well, Spielberg has made a movie that's more than three hours long. It's in black and white. It's about the Holocaust. Will it be uh, a difficult film to experience? Will people sit through it? 
I sat there spellbound. This is not a difficult film no. to watch. It's a difficult film to conceive of in terms of the subject matter, but in terms of the way he tells the story, it's completely absorbing at every single moment. We are there. I, I was, for many long stretches of time, I wasn't really even thinking that I was watching a film. Um, I went back and saw it a second time to prove that, and to myself that it wasn't such a, uh, you know, if you show the Holocaust, of course you're going to feel sad. Was it a gimmick in some sense? Was it borrowed interest? It was absolutely absorbing as a motion picture. Yes, it is. You know, one thing that I particularly noticed in Schindler's List was Spielberg's refusal to go for easy emotional payoffs. Spielberg is a director who has built his career on supplying jolts to our emotions in everything from the color purple to Jurassic Park to E.T., but here he creates an even greater power by using tremendous restraint. He simply shows us things and lets us supply our own feelings. Look at this scene, for example, which takes place after most of the Jews have suddenly been removed, leaving their luggage behind. A young Jewish man has evaded deportation and thinks fast when the Nazis arrive. I respectfully report I've been given orders to clear the bundles from the road so there will be no obstructions to the thoroughfare. And that's the sort of event that could easily be used to manipulate an audience. They could have punched it up. They could have put some music underneath it that really told you exactly how to feel instead of just suggesting the sadness of the mood. But Spielberg goes instead for a documentary quality all through the film. He realizes that the enormity of the Holocaust was not a series of big emotional highs and lows and crises and deliverances and retreats, but a reality, a grim reality that stretched on day after day and year after year, paralyzing the ability of people to deal with it emotionally. It's the very matter of fact quality of Schindler's List that makes it finally, I think, so overwhelming. Yes, I think that uh, there are scenes in here that are lifelike, totally unpredictable. There's a gun that jams. I don't want to give away too much. There's a gun that jams, and that scene goes on. It's terrifying. Yeah. The not shooting of a gun. I don't know if it's ever been more powerful in a film. Similarly, there's a scene where uh, the Nazis go into a house. They find Jew Jewish children inside a piano, and they shoot them. And then someone says, they hear a piano playing. They said, is that Mozart or uh, Bach? I mean, the smart people, yeah. this kind of, the joy of the killing was another thing that I was glad he showed. They're having a good time. Yeah. They're, they're enjoying what they're it's doing. It's target practice. And you know, what's interesting, too, is the way that Schindler's character is developed. Uh, at the beginning, as you suggested, he really wants to just make a lot of money. Right. By the end, he wants to save these people's lives. But at no point does he ever overtly express exactly what he's thinking. And so he has an interesting relationship with the Ben Kingsley character, the Jewish foreman, who has to read him and has to intuit what's happening inside his head because, of course, it could be instant death for this man if he says the wrong thing or guesses wrong. And so the two of them go on this ballet from tremendous uh, uh, greed uh, and uh, average to the, at the end of the movie when they're brothers, and they never really, at any point during that long uh, process, say exactly what's happening. Um, also, he isn't, Spielberg isn't explicit about why he did it. At what no. point did he do it? And then there's that wonderful spot use of color. Well, people will get to see a most amazing film and when they see Schindler's List. That's right. Coming up next, more new big holiday films, including Geronimo, the story of the Apache warrior, co-starring Gene Hackman and Robert Duvall. How's that wound, Mr. Seaver? Which one? Got him here, 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 here. Hell, I'm in real good. Ain't slowing me down none. We're not going anywhere. We don't want to fight. We came here to bring you to a reservation. That's Gene Hackman as an American general assigned to corral the Apache leader Geronimo. And Geronimo, an American legend, turns out to be a very good history lesson, both a tribute to the Indian culture and a document of the treacherous ways the American government and assorted bounty hunters dealt with Native Americans. Assigned to get Geronimo to surrender and take his tribe to a reservation is a young cavalry lieutenant played by Jason Patrick, one of our finest actors. Wes Studi from The Last of the Mohegans plays Geronimo, and there is a measure of respect between the two men as they face a relentless posse that wants to execute Geronimo immediately. I can't let you kill any of those men. Not so great. I aim for his head. One of the best characters in the film is a longtime Indian fighter played by Robert Duvall, wounded 17 times. But, uh, I think, uh, compared to you, I am somewhat honest. No offense intended, Lieutenant. You're speaking off the record, sir. I just uh, figure you're a real sad case. You don't love who you're fighting for. You don't hate who you're fighting against. 
Yeah. Also arresting is Gene Hackman as the general in charge of the Geronimo campaign. He respects Geronimo, but is angry here at the warrior, incorrectly thinking that he started a battle that killed many white men. There's no excuse for taking up arms against the United States Army. The Army is the best friend that Chiricahua ever had. You know it, and I know it. With all this land, why is there no room for the Apache? Why does the white eye want all land? What I like about Walter Hill's direction of this story is its simplicity. We meet one fresh character after another, and rarely in this sort of picture do the cavalry soldiers, the bad guys, have such fully developed personalities as they blunder their way through Washington's handling of Indian affairs. Geronimo in American Legend is a strong entertainment, but also, I think, an excellent film for students to see to learn about the not-so-distant past of America. It startled me when I realized this is only 105 years ago. Yeah, it's a terrific movie, uh, one of Walter Hill's best films, and I think that Lloyd Ahern's cinematography ought to be singled out because he makes these badlands and the lands on the Texas-Mexican border look so beautiful and at the same time so lonely, and you realize, in a way, not only why the Apaches love their land, but also, in a sense, how lonely it was for these soldiers who were out there chasing them around, and what they began to feel was a fruitless enterprise. And you know, there's a, it's funny that we should be reviewing this on the same show as Schindler's List, because here again are people being murdered because of their race, and it's thought-provoking to think that in this country it wasn't a crime to shoot an Indian dead a century ago. You could actually get paid a bounty if you did that. I think he was very smart um, uh, to make the characters of those pursuing the Indians so rich and put a lot of star power in that aspect of the film so that the st as we watch, we're seeing their reaction to Geronimo. Yes, we are. Yeah. And it's an inverse way of playing the picture rather than uh, what was done in the first revisionist westerns, which was to make the Indian heroic. It isn't that the Indian is heroic, it's that everybody is caught in a situation that shouldn't have ever been started because after all these people deserve to live on their land. When we come back, Whoopi Goldberg is a Vegas singing star turned choir director and Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit. Goldberg is the leader of the choir in Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, a disappointing sequel that misses the opportunity to build on what made the first film popular and instead recycles that very old, very tired formula about the poor kids who get their act together and take it to the state finals. Where have we seen this before? In the movie, Goldberg is now a successful Vegas headliner when the nuns from her old San Francisco school ask her to come back and help them. Amazingly, she does. Why? I don't know. Maybe because she knows there won't be a movie if she doesn't. I got the flow. Y'all gotta go. So go get your bags so we can go. Ho, ho. I was not a big fan of the original Sister Act, but at least that movie had some energy in it compared to this script straight off the assembly line. The most amazing thing I can say about Sister Act 2 is that it doesn't really need Whoopi Goldberg, since this cookie-cutter role doesn't have anything in it that really requires her special talents. This was astonishing. I mean, here you have a picture, I think, that did $140 million the first time. So you yeah. know this one, uh, if they do nothing, is going to make a lot of money, and that's what they did. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Yeah. And, and why not try? Why not try to come up with some sort of fresh story, challenge your character in some you know, way? What they did, they looked at the first movie, they threw out everything that worked, and they said, let's just, you know, let's not do anything that seemed to be inspired. Let's just take some old formula that's been done a thousand oh. times before. Mickey Rooney could have starred in this movie. I, it, shockingly bad film. Okay, our next movie, and here's a sequel that does work. Wayne's World 2, this time following the metalheads Wayne and Garth, Mike Myers and Dana Carvey, as they meet the rock group Aerosmith and try to recruit them for a concert to be called, of course, Wayne Stock. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! You're worthy, you're worthy, get up! Actually, most of the film is about babes, not music, and the boys' pursuit of babes, or in the case of the frightened Garth, the very funny way one babe, played by Kim Basinger, pursues him. Uh, 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 can I have some cocoa later? Uh, 
I just like the sound of that head hitting the wood of the door there. No, it's not as wild and as unpredictable as the original, but there are still plenty of surprises, including a continuing send-up of some of the images in Oliver Stone's film, The Doors, The Naked Indy, and Jim Morrison, Holier Than Thou. I like these characters, particularly Wayne's gentle, wise guy approach to life. Wayne's World 2 is very funny. I look forward to a third film in this series. I like the movie, too. Uh, it is funny. And, uh, you know, they're gentle and they're kind. They're nice people. If they ever get hard and cynical, uh, the series will be over. I know how, what they should do for Wayne's World 3. One of the boys is faced with marriage and leaving the other one. I think it would be terrific. That would be terrible. But, you know, the funniest thing in this whole movie, I think, is the fake karate fight scene with the very dubbed dialogue. And every time they move the arm, it goes... <laughs> When we come back, an imposter gets a warm welcome in six degrees of separation. What did you want from us? Our lasting friendship. For a willing audience, an art dealer, Donald Sutherland, and his wife, Dr. Channing, and their friend, Ian McKellen. My folks are divorced. He's remarried. He actually, he's doing a movie. He's in the movies? Uh, he's directing this one, but he does act. What, what's he directing? Cats. Later, they find out the young man was an imposter and share their stories with another couple who were fooled by the same young man. The friends are played by Bruce Davison and Mary Beth Kirk. We gave him $50. We gave him 25 He picked up a hustler. He left. He chased the burglar out of our house. He didn't steal anything. Six Degrees of Separation is well acted and written with a dialogue reflecting some of the same kind of strained, quasi-thoughtful posings that Tom Wolfe captures so amusingly in his novel Bonfire of the Vanities. But there's something important that's missing. I sense that seeing the play in New York, and I feel it even more now seeing the movie, and I think what's missing is a center of authentic humanity to act as a contrast to the beastliness of all of the characters. To quote the young man's favorite literary hero, Holden Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye, everyone in this movie is a phony. They deserve one another, but what have we done to deserve them? Well, in defense of the play, which I like more than the film, uh, I think that what he's saying is that uh, if, if that's true, why isn't that a fit subject for discussion? In other words, that the racial gap between the world, the economic gaps that are, exist in the world, mm -hmm. um, cause this kind of behavior. He's saying, uh, with, the, with, the, with the play in particular, I felt it much more in the play, that the, the, the title refers to that we're all connected in some way, and if we can find six people, we can connect ourselves to someone on another side of the planet and all that. And I felt that there was humanity in the play with that thought. But apart from that, James, didn't you feel that everyone was a, a pill in this movie? Uh, everyone? I thought that the, the, that the white, wealthy people in the film were way overdrawn because we saw more of them in and the what film. And what about the young black man? He's also seen in an extremely he, negative light. Uh, he's a, uh, he's, he's a very much, glib, he's but a, he's lying. Everything he, he says is yeah, a lie. But he's a more tra he is a more tragic character, and I thought that Will Smith's performance was very strong. Surprisingly good for I a cool TV actor. I don't know if he is more tragic or not. I think we could do a whole show on exactly what that character represents. Okay. Okay? When we come back with our video segment, we'll share some fond memories of Don Amici, who died earlier this week. Siskel and Ebert's Video Pick of the Week, brought to you by Orville Redenbacher, the first and last name in popcorn. Our video segment this week is devoted to the memory of a very special actor. I've interviewed a lot of movie stars over the years, but one of my favorites was Don Amici, who was already 80 years old when I met him, but filled with life and enthusiasm. When he died this week at age 85, he left behind a long life's work of over 50 films and countless TV shows, but his career was unusual because he was a star twice once as a young man and then again after a career slump as a gifted older actor. This is him in 1943 in Heaven Can Wait as a dead playboy who has a no-win argument with the devil. Uh, would you be good enough to mention, for instance, some outstanding crime you've committed? Crime? Crime? I'm afraid I can't think of any. But I can safely say my whole life was one continuous misdemeanor. And here's Amici 45 years later as an old man who regains the secret of eternal youth in Cocoon. Well, in general, I think we're having a great time. My own favorite Don Amici performance is one of his last ones in 1988 in David Mamet's Things Change. Amici won an Academy Award for Cocoon, and he was a big star in the 30s and 40s. But he told me during our interview, by 1949, I was through. He supported himself as a circus ringmaster on TV and at dinner theaters, but then his stardom started all over again with trading places in the 1980s. Now, what he still wanted to know, he told me, was the secret of why Spencer Tracy was such a good listener in the movies. He was 80 when he told me that, and I said, you mean you're still practicing to get better? And he said, I hope so. 
Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. Two very admiring thumbs up for Steven Spielberg's remarkable film, Schindler's List. It's one of the year's best films, opening in about 20 cities on December 15th and then in others later on. Two more thumbs up for Geronimo, an American legend, a visually stunning elegy to the last of the great Apache war leaders. Two thumbs down, though, for Sister Act Two, Back in the Habit, a disappointing formula film that hardly even needs Whoopi Goldberg for its tired old story. Two thumbs up for Wayne's World 2, more refreshingly offbeat craziness from Mike Myers and Dana Carvey. And finally, a split decision on Six Degrees of Separation, the drama about hypocritical New Yorkers outsmarted by an even better imposter than they are. Gene liked it more than I did, especially Will Smith's performance. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of The Pelican Brief, starring Julia Roberts as a murder witness who gives her story to a reporter, Denzel Washington, who also stars in Jonathan Demme's Philadelphia. That's next week. Until then, the balcony is closed. Stefano International Jeans in junior, Mrs. plus, girls and men's sizes. Available at over 1,300 Fashion Bug stores coast to coast. Fashion Bug fits your life. V8, 100% vegetable juice, the delicious and nutritious way to drink your vegetables. V8, drink your vegetables. The new Remington Triple Foil, the only shaver with three narrow micro screens. If you can grow it, we can shave it. Remington Triple Foil. It's America's favorite jelly bean, Jelly Belly. Now in new 20 and 40 flavor gift boxes, the original gourmet jelly bean, Jelly Belly. He's big, he's purple, and your kids love him. Find out about the making and marketing of Barney the Dinosaur. Plus, follow committed shopaholics for holiday bargains you'll have to see to believe.